As Janet said, happy Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the day where we celebrate the birthday of the church. So happy birthday, church. You're well over 2,000 years old and you're looking great. Uh, so yeah, the day of Pentecost is a change of seasons for us liturgically as we worship. Uh, the day of Pentecost, again, is the, celebrate of the, the celebration of the birth of the church by the reception of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised that he would send after he ascended into heaven. And now the Holy Spirit can be one of the most over-sentimentalized persons of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Spirit is often romanticized as merely this mystical or soothing agent of God who comes only to comfort us in our afflictions and suffering. Often in devotions or a lot of times in film or in books, the Holy Spirit is really over-romanticized as kind of this soothing comforter and soothing comforter alone. And don't get me wrong, it's correct and faithful to understand the Holy Spirit as our comforter. Even Jesus said today in our passage, in today's gospel, that he promises to send the advocate. And now if you remember, the New Testament is originally written in Greek, and there's a Greek word behind that word advocate, and that Greek word also means comforter. But based on what Janet read in the book of Acts, I think it's incomplete to reduce the Holy Spirit to only be something soothing and comforting, only the operative word. Now, that's probably a bit hard for us to hear because I think we like the reduced idea of the Spirit or God as only our comforter because it's safe. It's easy. It's one-directional. When God is only our comforter and only viewed as our consoler, then there's no expectation on us. But when we do that, when we reduce the Holy Spirit only into comforter, we are in danger of turning our faith into something quite passive and self-serving, which for centuries has been one of the main criticisms of Christianity, that Christians only use their Christianity in a self-serving way. And a famous example of that critique was when Karl Marx famously said that faith is the opiate, the opiate of the masses. In other words, he was saying that faith is nothing more to them than a mechanism to dull their pain. And that's it. Of course, I don't wholly agree with Karl Marx's assessment of the Christian religion, but... That's exactly what we turn our faith into when we only see it as a source of comfort, when we only see the Holy Spirit as our comforter. But the Spirit isn't solely our pain reliever. God's Spirit is much more dynamic than that. In fact, my friends, I think that the Spirit is actually kind of a problem for us just as much as the Spirit is a soother. To be perfectly honest, I wish the Holy Spirit was merely an opiate, merely a painkiller. I mean, how nice would that be if I could just simply receive comfort on this day of Pentecost, rest back satisfied and sentimental, never accountable, never respondent, never called, just comforted. Now again, I can't stress this enough. I do not mean to minimize those of us who do need real comforting. You shouldn't feel ashamed of that and leaning into your faith for said comfort. The Holy Spirit is indeed sent to be with you in your real suffering, to be strength and peace, and that is no small thing. But this is not all that the Spirit of Jesus is. To comfort us, is not the only reason that Jesus sent us his spirit. He also sent it to invigorate us. 
He also sent it to create and sustain a movement called the church to continue his radical work. So the Spirit, this faith of ours, is not merely therapeutic. We don't come to worship merely to receive spiritual ibuprofen. But in the words of theologian David Loos, the Holy Spirit does not come to solve our problems. Rather, the Spirit comes to create them. And the problem the Spirit creates for us is this. We are shown in the book of Acts today that this faith is most certainly not only about ourselves. Our relationship with God is not purely about us. The Holy Spirit drives God's people out into the world to be community, to proclaim God's love to others, and to serve our neighbor. So this is what I mean when I say tongue-in-cheek, that the Holy Spirit is a problem. The Spirit came to get us off of our behinds to continue God's work with our hands. And that's exactly what happens in today's passage from the book of Acts. When the Spirit of Christ descends upon the earth, the Spirit literally blasts into a room where a bunch of people were comfortably secluded. And that Spirit thrust them out into activity. And not just any activity, but uncomfortable activity. Just again, look what happens here in Acts. They were interrupted with wind and fire, which is its own disturbing thing. And then they're driven out of their place of comfort to speak the languages of other people, to spread the story of God's love, to speak to and create community with those who were different from them. And all this spirit-led activity in this book of Acts was so intense that some of the first audience members of this activity thought these early disciples were behaving like a bunch of drunk people. As it says in your scripture today, somebody accused them, they're filled with new wine. In other words, they're hammered. Don't listen to them. And Peter had to be like, hey man, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. And that's where scripture provides some comedic relief. Nevertheless, then Peter had to preach to these people, give them an impromptu sermon. And then what these first members of the church were sent to do was to share everything that they had, to sell their possessions and distribute the proceeds to those in need. So no, the Holy Spirit is not only our comforter, but also our agitator our agitator. So next time you open the washing machine and throw in your laundry and you look at the agitator, I want you to think of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who don't know what that looks like, you need to do laundry, okay? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is our agitator who stirs the people of God into radical action for the sake of love in the world. Again, this is the problem that Christ's spirit creates for us, that our Christian faith is not just some private, secluded, and therapeutic thing. Rather, with a forceful gust, we are sent out, out of private living, out of isolation, and into meaningful community that matters, sent to evangelize, sent to welcome the stranger, sent to clothe, heal, and feed people, sent to proclaim that Jesus is God, sent to comfort one another in our grief, sent to speak out against oppression and violence and injustice. We are sent out there to speak truth to power. We are sent out to sacrifice for our neighbor and to live generously and to live with mercy, to continue the movement. The Holy Spirit is a problem a problem that beckons us out from this lawn and these sanctuaries into a dark world that desperately needs more light and love. 
And that's daunting. That is not going to be easy. That is going to be filled with exhaustion, filled with risk and ridicule. It's going to be uncomfortable, my friends. But I want you to remember, the Holy Spirit that we speak of today is right there with you and within you. And that spirit is powerful. This is the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. This is the spirit that took a few disciples, known by no one with no resources and no army, and turned that hillside movement into a global religion. This is the spirit of wind and fire. And that spirit is in you. So go forth. Amen.